Okay, so this is Billy Hines, um, uh, who's made a number of comments here, who will be talking about, uh, check my glasses on, uh, societal resilience and um, um, in European uh, urban infrastructure, and we'll be interested to hear about that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for inviting me here to present today. Um, I, I took a slightly different slant and I put myself in the place of society. Um, we deal a lot every day with different types of society, so we always try to place ourselves in the place of society. To us is our ultimate end user. So everything we do has to be for that end user. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, try, trying to house this in the European context, bring in uh, its relationship with the US, um, and I'm mindful that we don't have that, a lot of collaboration, as you mentioned earlier. Um, looking at some of the risk analysis approaches, the shortcomings, the societal resilience, and you know, what, what future analytics are doing in this space of resilience, risk, and the society. Just to uh, map very simply um, the, the kind of the critical events in Europe um, over the last, say, 20, 25 years mm -hmm. of what's happened um, regarding disasters. Um, some of these you may be very familiar with, particularly the more recent ones. So we've had the, the, the toxic waste spill in the, the mine in Spain. We've had the floods in Central Europe. We've had the heat wave and particularly that affected France. The terrorist attacks in London. The earthquake in Central Italy. And then more recently, the events of Paris. Um, what's, what's becoming um, quite, quite common is the, uh, the occurrence of these and the, the, the different levels, both man-made and natural, of these events. And trying to understand, plan, prepare for these is a big, big consideration for us in Europe. So looking at society within this, um, and this is quite interesting. Um, is this a pointer? I think this might be the point. Yeah. So, so everything we do, as I said, is citizen-centric. And we have, we have a fantastic uh, 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 example that we use at home, um, this is home being Ireland, that, that everything comes from the, the home, from, from the house, from the neighbourhood that expands out then, um, both into the neighbourhood, into the local town, the bigger town, the city, etc. And what, what we're trying to do is we use this term called critical mass. And we're trying to, say, provide functions and the services that match the needs of that population. And as th that population increases, well, then functions and services should increase with it. However, with that, there are a number of, say, influences, external influences that impact on that critical mass provision. From natural disasters, climate change, man-made disasters, and others. You know, and again, I'll touch on this in a minute, the others being for us, in Ireland in particular, we've had massive financial stresses and strains for the last 10 years. So how have we responded to that? Can you, can you describe a critical mass of services or a critical mass of people? So the critical mass is the person, the people. So you have to provide the services and facilities to match that critical mass of people. So you've, if you have 500 people, you should provide services accordingly and facilities accordingly. If you have 5,000, well, then they ramp up. Okay. So again, and we've touched on these um, throughout the course of the last two days, has have mainly been tackled through a, a risk analysis perspective. And we have standards, we have standards and guidelines, as we all know, coming out through our eyes. They're massive, massive. We've got the ISO standards on risk management and risk assessment. And we always find these very kind of um, uh, formulaic. So you identify the risk, you analyze the risk, you evaluate it, and then you produce a plan for it. You know what I mean? And this is very, pretty, kind of almost pretty expected. However, Global change is a phenomenon that's on us, and we're going to have to plan for these unexpected incidents. And with this uncertainty, there's a call for a different approach. We feel there's a different approach that is essential. Um, not, not, not saying forgetting about the excellent standards and guidance that are there, but let's harness those and work with those to look for this different approach. The, re the resilience approach, and I know we've discussed resilience and the definitions of resilience, and I'm going to come to my definition th in the end of this talk. I've saved it till the end. Um, so resilience emerged as a fusion of ideas 
of new risk management approach in the early 2000s. That's what we feel. And with that, resilience is a bridge beyond protection. Uh, and this is particularly coming from David's work. We just did this simple graph using Google Analytics. We did this in our own company. And this maps the, the use, the, the, the searchability of the word resilience um, going back to the early 2000s. And what you can see from this is, and you can see it's an, it's an index measure. And you can see the different spikes, and the different spikes respond to different events that have happened. But now we're at a measure in October 2015 that resilience index is, is searched or Googled at a 99 level of index. And if you compare that to, say, the word terrorism, that's at about mid-30s. So resilience, the word resilience is up there in kind of people's mindsets in terms of, let's find out what this is about. It, that was an interesting analysis. Some of the shortcomings in the context of the current situation about the res res resilience approach. Again, I said this is quite formulaic, applying standards guidelines. It's trying to understand the urban, regional, and critical infra infrastructure functions. Uh, they model, simulate, and analyze. So they tend to focus mainly on the physical. There's limited practical experience of societal resilience in Europe. However, research indicates the established ways of organizing of critical decision making will not suffice in the case of a catastrophic breakdown. So the community at, at tend to adopt. And this is particularly coming from the work of Bianca McConnell after the Hurricane Katrina. They said that the citizen actually knows nearly better how to respond and adapt in the face of crisis. So you can have all these models and analysis and stuff, but knowing what the citizen wants is actually at the core of it. So some of the current approaches that are concentrated on in this resilience term. So we have business continuity and a financial sector strengthening. This was massive in Europe over the last 10, 10 years because of the crisis that we have went through. So we're devel developing resilience models around these. And then we have the increase in the whole uh, the, 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 the confidence level. So we, we, we spoke about, and Dale mentioned many of these in the 100 resilient cities, in the Siemens work that they're doing, and in the US, U, sorry, UNISDR, in the, the scorecard. And I'll come back to that in a second. And there's also this emerging area of increasing CI protection. And we have the, the, uh, the work that's being done. Sorry, sorry CI protection. Critical infrastructure, apologies, critical infrastructure. So we have looking at critical infrastructure as a, an asset to resist disruptive events. And this drop approach, which is the disaster resilience of place, work being done by Cutter. And what this is saying is that this is very at a local level. However, that it's, it's still, still somewhat theoretical and it needs to be applied to more the, the macro meso level. So we need to look at this. But it's, it's, it just shows work that's going on. You've seen this before, I'm sure. Dale, thank you very much for this. Um, so, so these are our 10 essentials. But what I want to focus on is the number seven, the societal essential. And the societal one is to understand and strengthen societal capacity for resilience. And identifies how the courage and effectiveness of growth, oh, sorry, the grassroots organizations, societal connectedness and cohesion, private sector and business continuity planning, and systems of engagement in place can play an important role in bolstering societal uh, resilience after a disaster. So we feel that essential has a really strong part to play in societal engagement. And again, looking at the work of the UNISDR, the resilience of society in respect to potential hazards events is determined by the degree in which the community has the necessary resources and is capable of organizing itself both prior and during the times of this period of, event, of the event. So why enhance res the, the, the societal resilience? We've used these words about sustainability, urban sustainability, societal de development. If you enhance it, you give the society, the person, increased confidence. In increased confidence leads to growth. It leads to economic growth. It leads to environmental growth. It leads to societal growth, all leading to better preparedness, management, and the ability to recover, leading to an increased citizen quality of life. However, at the center of this are the keys of 
prevent depopulation. And you might wonder what I mean by that. It's the very opposite to urbanization. So in Ireland, for example, we have huge depopulation, huge movement from the rural, the small villages, the small towns to these urban areas. So that is a big issue for us, particularly if you're going back to my term about critical mass and trying to support that critical mass. That's a big issue for us. So with that, you have to plan for urbanization and proper planning can lead to better quality of life and ensuring progressive enhancement. And what I mean by that is with urbanization and depopulation, you have to make sure that you're, in, you're, you're planning for very multicultural um, society that's happening. We've again experienced that in Ireland over the last 20 years. We've had to change dramatically how we plan. So that is very important to look at this progressive enhancement. So just, I'm just going to very quickly take you through uh, this, uh, uh, some uh, strategies that we feel could widen the incremental approach towards better resilience. And again, these are in development, development by us, but through our projects, through our work with the community, through our work with government agencies, etc. but just maybe need some consideration. And we have seven of them, seven, seven of them there. So again, number one, the, the challenge that it, we could do it better if it happened here, mentality. The use of readily available indicators. Extend business continuity plans to include societal aspects. Improve data capture and use. Enhance communication and engagement. Looking at the ecological and environmental resilience, which is still hugely important. And update and integrate early warning systems and the, the technologies around that. So people-centric approaches, and again, this is led by work by the, done by Delon and others since 2006. So I'm not going to take you through all this, but just basically it's about, for the society, it's about risk knowledge, warning, dissemination, and response. And it's understanding that, that what the society wants within that. So in terms of the risk analysis in Europe compared to the US, and this might be somewhat controversial, but we'll say it anyway. So there's claims and counterclaims. So in Europe, and again, looking at this precautionary principle, in Europe, we, we, we take this precautionary principle uh, very seriously from the, from the societal point of view. So we're trying to always protect the citizen, or so we claim. In the US, what one might say has come true, that we're always looking at the monetary value of protection within the precautionary, precautionary principle. However, in reality, neither the US or, U or Europe can claim that they are categorically precautionary, whether it's in terms of societal or in terms of the monetary. So we don't really know. So again, real work needs to be done in this area. It's just a thought process. It's just to throw it out there for, for a, a, a discussion. In terms of us and what's happening, so within the, the US, sorry, in the, in the EU research space, there's a lot of work going on in here. This is funded re research by Europe. There's a lot of different things happening in resilience and society. A lot of different projects, a lot of different consortium coming together, funded by Europe, trying to get people to think, trying to get uh, nations, states to, to think um, about what the future is going to hold for society. From us, we are uh, a, a, an SME. We look at uh, planning, economics, and research. And we try to bring that into our everyday life, given an evidence-based um, approach to better decision-making and policies. Where we sit in this space, we've been really fortunate um, to be involved in the whole resilient space of, of society, large-scale infrastructure, critical infrastructure, the community, and extreme weather in these spaces here. So we, this is resilience. Igor may have mentioned it earlier. We coordinate this, and this is looking at the resilience of critical infrastructure in Europe. Very similar to uh, Emmanuel's project um, that was funded this year. Harmonize, that we coordinate as well. This is looking at the res resilience of large-scale infrastructure. So it's the urban fabric and trying to protect that. 
So it's kind of setting aside critical infrastructure, but looking at the, the urban fabric. Intact is a project that is looking at the resilience of critical infrastructure from extreme weather events. And if you can see from looking at our timeline from Europe, they are increasing as well. And Cobacore is a very interesting uh, project, and it stands for community-based uh, uh, comprehensive recovery. So it's putting the community at the heart and seeing what they need in a state of disaster uh, and crisis. And again, it's coming back to information sharing, information gathering. And we've been very fortunate to be involved in all these. So our knowledge base is increasing all the time and it's, we're really applying it. Finally, these are the institutions that have become really active in Europe in the whole space of resilience research. And you may know many of these, but again, these are really uh, bringing to the forefront this whole research space of resilience. Thank you for your attention. And if you want to, there is my contact details. Thank you very much. Let me see here. Again, we have time for two questions or responses. Please. Uh, question, Billy. Yes, sir. Your strategy number one. Uh, has to do with uh, trying to change the idea that it can't happen here. Uh, lots of research done on the human inability to deal mentally with high consequence, low probability events. So can you talk some more about how do you actually do strategy number one, overcoming it can't happen here? Well, it's in, in one sense, it's, it's a mindset. And I think that mindset is changing because people are beginning to realize that actually it can happen here. We didn't think it could, but now we're realizing it can. To give you an example of a very Irish-based situation, um, since the, 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 the catastrophic events of Paris, very soon after, our Minister for Defense says, we have really good uh, reactionary, uh, resilience uh, plans in place if this happened here. Very quickly we, they realised actually when they were challenged that we hadn't. So now we're having to completely change our strategy on that, you know what I mean? So we might have what we think are um, uh, mechanisms or methods for dealing with this but we have at a very micro level, not at this big vast impact level. So again we're having to change that. So looking back, yes we are realising to go, to go back to your question about it can't happen here or it's unlikely to happen here, we're realizing, realizing it actually can happen here and we're having to really ramp up, this is Ireland, our strategy for this protectionism, this resilience, etc. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, just, just, just a brief one. It's maybe one that will just hang over and it maybe will link into what Jose is going to talk about tonight. So I've been to a lot of gatherings in Europe and um, people have talked about societal resilience, they've talked about civil resilience and they talk about community resilience yeah so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just interested in do you differentiate between those in, in any way um, because they seem they seem to be used in very interchangeably in much of that dialogue that I, I've certainly had yeah well um, what, what we're finding is um, that the, the term resilience um, uh, can be uh, mean different things to different people or different organizations and different institutions and I'll give you an example for, from the, for the work that we're doing, say, in Resilience, one of our partners is Energy to Portugal. And we had a tour of their um, command and control centre in Lisbon. And if you ask them, and they told us openly, they don't even consider the word resilience. But they know it in a different space, a completely different space. But what they're doing every day to, to ensure continuity of, of service is resilience. So there's many different terminologies about this, and integrating them is quite a difficult thing. I, I did say at the end, and coming back to your point, John, I did say at the end, I would give you my simple definition of three, three words. That is vulnerability, resilience, and risk. So to me, vulnerability is about the um, level of exposure and the sensitivity of the person, society, whatever, to that exposure. Resilience, to me, is... The, um, is the, the ability to, to kind of respond and recover from an event, be it the society, the person, whatever the, the situation, the institute may be, but within that, mitigating and preparing for a future event. So that's 
where I look at the resilience cycle, the four stage resilience cycle. So, to, so the two of them, I, I always kind of treat them as kind of like, if you want to use the word framework, they're like frameworks or whatever. The, finally, the word risk, risk, whether it's risk management, risk assessment, risk coordination, I actually think sits within both of those. So it's a, it's, it's a mechanism within vulnerability, within resilience, but it's there to be used to a, a assist you in kind of measuring, mitigating, preparing for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.